Good evening, Wendell. Good evening, Michelle. How are you? <laughs> I'm even better now that I'm seeing your smile. So thank you so oh. much for being here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for what you're doing. You you really make it a difference. You your voice changes things, boy. It changes, it changes things. Thank you, Wendell. You're so sweet. You're so sweet. I'm grateful that you said yes. I'm even more grateful that I met you through a panel that we did a few Gosh, it must have been like a month ago we did a panel yeah. discussion and it was wonderful and I got to know you a little bit better and I was thrilled that you said yes to joining me on Michelle's Conversations That Matter. Um, what I'm up to with my series, Wendell, is to cause more open dialogue about mental health. Really huh? maybe inspire people, educate people, um, have those maybe a little uncomfortable conversations that people can learn from, maybe grow from. So um, when People like you say yes, it gets me very excited. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so could you, could you do us a favor, Wendell, introduce yourself, tell us where you live, what you do, um, a little bit about yourself. Well, my name and I, you all, excuse me, I have to do it this way because it's the only way that I know how to. My name is Win Hale. Feels. Oh, I like saying that name you all. I think I said it again. When Dale feels Woo! gets me every time you all. I know y'all think it's funny. Y'all think I'm being comical. But guess what? It wasn't too long ago, you all, that I even accepted that name, that I even liked that name. I associated that name with always getting, <laughs> stepping my foot in it. I'm telling you, until one day, a lady by the name of Philandra Johnson, she hadn't seen me in a number of years, and she saw me um, at the uh, mental health center, and she said, when Dale feels, how are you, boy? Where you been? Now, she didn't see me, like, frontwards. She saw me from the side back and knew who I was. And I never had heard somebody say my name in a positive light like that. And since then, I've always used it to talk to people and introduce myself, especially with these type of things. One, it helps because you, you remember my name because when they'll say people will say Wendell and that's not how my name is pronounced. It's Wendell. So it, it gives a little oomph to it. Got it. Got it. Where do you live, Wendell? Ah, I live in the good state of Georgia. Um, oh. Good old Atlanta. Yes, do. Where they doing all these countings, boy. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot there. It's a lot. But yeah, that's where I live. What do you do for a living? You didn't tell us what you do for a living. What do you do? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just so excited okay. to be on here, y'all. I know. Y'all just, just don't know. Michelle. It's Michelle. Oh. Well, well, let me tell you, what I am is called a HUM navigator. And so what HUM stands for is High Utilization Management Navigator. So what I do is I help individuals who, who go to the hospital or inpatient or a crisis stabilization unit a whole lot, like every month, like almost every week. And what I do is I try to help this individual get services so they can get stabilized as well as so they can get their independence. Mm -hmm. And so with all of this, I navigate that person through services that's for them. It could be an act team. It can be an intensive case management team. It can be case management. It can be where we um, care for autism or it can be like for a 28 day um substance abuse recovery center. It, it can be those type of things that I'm navigating that client to get mm -hmm. services. Now, that's one of my jobs. Okay. Now, the other job that I do is I'm on a mobile crisis response team. And mm -hmm. in that, we assist and aid individuals that might be going through a crisis that could be um, alcohol and drug related. It can be mental health related, or it could be developmental disability related. 
And mm -hmm. so we go out and we try to assist the person with resources or supports, or sometimes individual might have to be in inpatient because at that time they're endangerment to themselves mm -hmm. or to other people. And so those are the amazing jobs that I do. That's amazing. Yeah, I love the work. I loved our uh, panel conversation and learning a little bit about your work. And I get your heart, get how, much you, how deeply you care for human beings and for life. Um, could you take a second, Wendell, and walk us through why th this work so personal for you? And what is your story and what is your relationship to mental health? Well, that is an amazing story because at first I wanted to go into veterinary medicine at Tuskegee University. <laughs> and it ended up that um, for me, you all, this is personal because I am diagnosed with major depression. And in that, um, it has taken over my life like nobody's business. And although I have a degree in psychology, and yeah, I know maybe the verbiage, it's a different thing between doing this job and just doing any other type of job in, in, in the field of mental health. Mm -hmm. I can understand where an individual would hate to use medications, would not like to go to therapy, would, would hate to even mention the 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 words mental health um because of my diagnosis and my journey hasn't been easy um when you when you are born two pounds ten ounces oh. and and the doctor comes to your grandmother and says who do you want to live because your mom um has eclampsia and for those that don't know that's where um, the person has high blood pressure. And in having that high blood pressure, it affects them physically. They have seizures, they pass out, um, they're incontinent, their um, blood pressure is so high that they sort of like just break down. And apparently my mom had did that. And in that, she, they had to go to my grandmother. And I have to say this to my grandmother, bless her heart, she's passed now, but she said this to the doctor, both of them are going to live. Now she said that in her faith. And in that, my grandmother was the one that gave me my first voice. So it's, it's, it's very deep um, with that. But weighing two pounds, 10 ounces, of course, they, they put me in an incubator and I developed pneumonia and they said that I'd be a, 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 a disability person. Hmm. Basically said that I would have disabilities and um, developmental disabilities. And lo and behold, I got released. I got fat and, and, and everything. And guess what? I was brought into the world under the protection of my parents. And in mm -hmm. all of this, I learned the new things about life. I learned about the smells, the taste, the feels, the, the whole experience of life being anew. And I tell you, the smell of that birthday cake. Oh my, that's a good eating right there. Good smell. <laughs> but you all, even though I had those good old times, it ended up that I was sexually abused at a young, young age, like four or three, okay? And I learned about sex at an early age. And, and in that, I just wasn't abused by women. I was abused by men too. And so it scared my thinking, okay? Sure. In this also, I ended up, um, because I was low in weight and low in size, um, I got picked on. I got bullied a lot when I was small. And so it caused me to to underperform in school. It caused me to be, as, as some people would say, dumb. But I just, I didn't have the umph or the willingness because of those things that have occurred. And you know, you're young. You don't know how to deal with all this stuff that's going right. on. It's new. Right. And it ends up that with all of this, I end up going on and going to, 
high school. And in high school, I thought that with me, because I was an oratorical contest winner. My mama put me in that. Oh, yes, she did. And it made me feel <laughs> confident about myself. But when I went on to high school, uh, <laughs> I got picked on there because of how I dressed. And so I was bullied about that. And there was a low expectations um, with me and my grades. I was a CDF person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somehow I got to high school. In high school, I was a CDEFG person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then a teacher talked to me because I plagiarized, you know, a book, you know, and turned it in as an assignment. And well, uh, she said, what's wrong with you? She said, you're better than this. Mm -hmm. And she challenged me to do mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And you know what? This joker went from CDF, G, and all the rest of the alphabets lower to being an ABC student mm -hmm. because she challenged me. Mm -hmm. And I got up there and I was like, good gracious life. I'm smart. I'm smart. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it it developed a sense of, I think I can go to college because I wasn't thinking about going to college because mm -hmm. I felt that I was too dumb, too stupid to even do that. And it ends up, I go to college, but due to the bullying and all of that, I changed. Instead of focusing on my studies, you lost, I, I focus on being accepted by others. I went to the parties. I I, I, I drank. I, I didn't do drugs. I was too scared of that. I, you know, the marijuana, because it was rampant. But I couldn't do that. The crack cocaine, all of that was there. It was, it was being offered, and I chose not to do that. And I chose to try to, to hook up with the girls and be a player, you know, and all this, and not focusing on my studies. And I ended up getting... Um, on academic probation. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, I was trying to pledge online too, and it just wasn't a good combo. Mm -hmm. In fact, I got on academic probation twice. And in that, you all, uh, with uh, an attempt to, to take my life, wow. I had to leave the school and I left. Okay. And I went to an all Christian school or Roberts University, way in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And guess what? <laughs> My grades went up. <laughs> I mean, boy, did they ever go up. And I was surprised again about what I could do because with the bullying and all these things occurring, I didn't think that I had the oomph right. to do well. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? I go there, got the grades, but had a good old operation. And that operation knocked me out the box. And I got on academic probation and I was sent home. So mm -hmm. I go home, a failure, all these feelings and thoughts. And it ends up, you all, that um, I, I get a great job. I, I, I become a minister. Mm -hmm. I, I, I not only become a minister, but but I get married. And and I, I get some money because I'm working. Hey, because a degree, you know, hey, hey. You all, although I got married because of the molestation, it played a role in my divorce. Mm -hmm. It, With all of that happening also, the job that I got, because of the degree that I had, it wasn't paying a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I got ridden up on the job, and it was just a downhill thing that was happening. And so after three months, well, after being married for 13 years, the divorce came. And out of that came a three-year-old son also that my wife and I had had. And, uh, and arrears came up in the mail. And in that arrears, ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I lost it. Mm. I felt that I wasn't uh, anything anymore. I, mm. I couldn't even be a father. Wow. And in that, I tried to take my life by um, getting hit by a train while driving. And as I'm getting ready to get hit, I heard a voice, my higher power, say two words, your son. Your son. 
And in that, ladies and gentlemen, I went to go get help. I didn't get hit, but my car got hit and everything. But here it is. I'm alive. But in that, it was the struggle of coping and dealing with being depressed. Right. And um, that's that's some of the story wow. uh, that I've gone through. But it gets better, you all. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because Wendell, we're here to talk about men's mental health and we want other men to know sort of how you've been able to navigate it. I mean, what's your formula? Could you share with the men who might be listening? I envision a young man who who maybe needs to hear what you have to say. Like, how did you navigate that? It was a hard navigation mm -hmm. because of, you know, I, I want to be the macho man. I want to be all men and that's all that you can have to be we are never ever supposed to be emotional we are never ever supposed to be soft yeah. we are never supposed to be in the mind frame of being a sissy yeah and in that you all it was hard to navigate through that because i've had all the stigma that's involved with men's mental health and being right stigmatized being labeled as not good enough because you know that's what people think when they think about mental health right. you're not good enough you're 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 inferior something's wrong with you you've broken these type of things and those thoughts from the outside started to work on the inside of me and I started stigmatizing my own self you're not mm -hmm. good enough you're this, you're that, you're, you, 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 you don't matter. You don't have a voice. And I had to maneuver through that with, of all things, going to therapy. It didn't work the first time, you all. I hated it. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah. I had to take medications. Hated it. Was scared mm -hmm. of it. Didn't do it for mm -hmm. a while. And when I did do it, guess what? It made me feel so loopy, you all. I was scared of medications because of the side effects. Mm -hmm. But not only that, but I found out that I don't sleep good. I have sleep apnea. So when you go, to, when I go to sleep, my air is cut off. And yeah. that air and not being able to sleep well affects my mood, how yeah. I think, and those symptoms. And then I wasn't eating right. And not only not eating right and not resting, but I didn't do things that was relaxation for me. Now, for me, you all, I don't drink alcohol and I don't use drugs. Okay, so I have to find other ways. So I go work out. I, yeah. I, I might do um, poetry, writing. Mm -hmm. um, I might <laughs> go bowling. It's, you know, those those it sound like that's boring, but no. you all. It gives me that creativity to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I like those things. And I started learning how to use the community supports as well as resources. Mm -hmm. These are the things that helped me. But guess what? I had to be vulnerable. Yeah. And I had to be honest with myself. Right. These are the things that really have helped me mm -hmm. to maneuver through this thing called mental health. And so, men, and let me so, say this, and men, please, it's time that you take care of yourself. We're talking about longevity. If I would have had committed suicide, my son would not be here with me because he contemplated suicide. I found out my mom contemplated suicide. I found out my sister contemplated suicide. And for us to still be alive, it breaks that. I'm not going to make it feel. I want the pain to end feel. Mm -hmm. Men, take care of yourself. Please. Wendell, when you said before that you hated the therapy at first and you didn't like the drugs, what mm -hmm. kind of care are you under now? And how did you get to the point? Did you just try a different therapist? Did you try a different prescription? Like, or are you just totally managing it on your own now? No, um, believe it or not, 
I had a caring supervisor who came to me mm. and said, my, my job performance was going down. She said, what's wrong with you? Her name is Teresa Johnson. She is a fabulous, <laughs> a fabulous therapist. She said, what's wrong? And at that moment, I was scared to be honest. I was scared to be vulnerable. But I went on and told her how I had been once again thinking about ending my life. And she, she listened. And in her listening, it just it, it caused all these feelings and thoughts to just come up and out. And she convinced me, hey, maybe you could get some help. And then she opened up and shared her story with me about her depression wow. and the medications that she was taking. Wow. And it changed yeah. the whole thing. It, it was like literally like we was we, we was on the telephone. And I remember I was heading into the grocery store and it lit up as soon as I was able to talk to her about everything. Mm -hmm. And you all, I got on the med that works for me. Yeah. I can't say that all meds work the same because they right. don't. It's different strokes for different folks. But I found the one that works for me. And in it, I've been taking my I've been taking my medications now for over three years mm -hmm. and it works for me. The things that I'm telling you about, the 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 drawing, the poetry, all of that good yeah. stuff, it helps me. This medication helps me to focus as well as concentrate. And it 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 the the brain is either making too much of a chemical or too less of a chemical. And so in that, for me, those medications help me level off and cause me to be able to focus, to be able to concentrate. And my my feelings and my thoughts are not all over the place. Right. It helps me to get in and focus in. And you all, I've been creative ever since. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I love about that story that you just shared is that it was a supervisor. And I think about that that probably took something for her to be that vulnerable with you. But in her having the courage to step outside of the supervisor role and just be a human being and just extend herself to you and be vulnerable, open the door to be able to support you. Um, that like touches my heart. I think that's amazing. We need more people like that in the world. Tell me about it. And, and it inspired me so much. I mean, the help that not only that Kevin has done and that Teresa did, it, it, it helped me to extend my reach as far as trying to help other people. Yeah. And so when you mention about what makes me do what I'm doing, it's like, I know and I understand, I might not understand all of it now. Right. But I can, I can, I can relate to you big time to yeah. not wanting to mm -hmm. do this or that because it's scary. You don't right. know what's going to happen, but right. I can tell you and promise you, it gets so much better. Yes. Yes. But okay. you got to be honest. You got to be honest. You got to be yes. honest. <laughs> Listen, you, people don't know this about you. And I didn't, I didn't know about this until I, <laughs> until I was snooping around that you were in a movie. You, you were not in just an ordinary movie. You were in a documentary called The Ripple Effect. It's and suicide. I, I remember, I remember when this this um, documentary was released. Um, there's a, a crisis line in my own town, and they were hosting a viewing of it. And I went to it because I was very intrigued by it. And mm -hmm. that movie touched my heart. That documentary, The Ripple Effect, really moved me. So you were in it. You had a cameo appearance. We're gonna Woo! show the doc. I want to show the trailer in a moment, but. Oh, wow. Could you take a moment and share with us what was that experience like? And then what's Kevin Hines like? Let me tell you, when I met Kevin Hines, you all, I was at a um, uh, at a mental health symposium that the that the Department of Mental Health was giving. 
and he spoke, you all. And the man was, I, I was hanging on his every word when he shared his story. And after he shared his story, I started crying. <laughs> and in that crying, it was because he, his story touched my heart because what you all don't know, I was planning on killing myself again. And to hear him talk about in the midst of jumping off the Golden State Bridge and falling down to the water, he says these words. He says, what am I doing? I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. And I broke down and I cried because I, you know, on the inside, I was saying, I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. But I don't know how. Yeah. And I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Right. I went to him. I, I shook his hand and told him, man, you saved my life. And he said, huh? And I say, man, you saved my life. And he said, well, hold on. Let me speak to you for a moment. Let me get, just hold on. Hold on. Let me get your name, your number, this and that. And I say, sure, sure. And he got up there and he was greeting other people. And so I just faded on off into the crowd and, and, and went on. Who would have believed this? It's, this is going to be. A, he gets up there. How about he comes to the mobile crisis team to talk about his movie and showing the different avenues that a person can use to manage a crisis. And so he comes to um, GCAL, which is Georgia Crisis and Excess Line, okay? He gets up there, he comes, and he looks at me, and I looked at him. He said, I know you. I say, I know you too. <laughs> and he said, I say, yeah, you saved my life. He said, but you never did tell me how. Mm -hmm. And I say, man, and then he, he just stopped. He say, hold up. You say, I'm going to get this in the film. I want to put this in the film. Craig, put this in the film. That's, that's <laughs> literally what he was saying. And so, and so he, we, we get up there. We do that part um, as far as in the office. And so he said, Wendell, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to take a walk down this parking lot. And you're going to tell me what you're going to tell me. Because I don't want to hear it right now. But tell me once we get down there. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 and so we, we, we start and, and what you see in the movie is me and him walking yeah. and, he t and, and I tell him how he saved my life. Wow. And, and he's crying. I'm about to cry. But <laughs> just, uh, let me tell you, Kevin <laughs> Hines is a loving and caring person. He only wants the best, not just for, for you, but he wants the best for himself. And that's yeah. why he shares his story so much because yeah. he ministers, it helps. It helps to break the stigma. It helps break the, the disconnect yeah. because yeah. he helps to connect you. And he, and I say, you saved my life. He said, no, Wendell, I did not save your life. I just changed your perspective. And, and I said, Started, ex I, I started accepting that, but I always say he saved my life, but mm -hmm. he really did change my perspective because what happened if I did do and it did not happen that I died? Right. I would bring more stress on me, my family, the other friends and people that I love and care about. Mm -hmm. It, it will put them at a loss. And once again, my son, yeah. uh, my son now is 15. Wow. And if I would have had did that, what would that showed him about life? Yeah. That once it gets hard and once it gets tough. Right. You say All goodbye. Right. <laughs> Could so we show him? Should we show it to him? Okay. Should we? <laughs> I think we're teasing them enough here. Okay. <laughs> So let's do that. Let's see. All right. We're going to do it. So keep an open mind. Keep an open mind.
never forget that they were our heroes too. I was very nearly a statistic. And the facts are that Aboriginal men are six times more likely to die by suicide. For every one death by suicide, at the very least, 115 people are directly affected. I found out Dwayne you know, took his life. My first initial reactions were, it was my fault. It shattered people's lives. It wasn't just a thing where it changed them for a week or a month or six months. It was a lifetime. We lost our son, Matthew. He's 20 years old. I wondered if I did something wrong. In 2008, my brother passed away by suicide. He was only 19 years of age. If he had have realised what that ripple effect, what had happened, he never would have done it. How does any parent live with that grief? He will always be the son I lost. When a family endures suicide, they need help. And uh, in your case, you survived. And I, I really went through help. When I got the call, and since then, I played myself. 15 years now. You were the first person and a consistent person to ever say, you know, Kevin, you should talk about this. You stood up and told your story. And there wasn't a dry room, a dry eye in the whole place. Today, I traveled the globe spreading a message of hope. Why? Because we know it helps people heal. I was thinking about killing myself. And because of you, I'm, I'm living, but yet because of what you said and everything, I'm able to give back even more. There are people out there that need to hear from someone who's got the lived experience and, and who's been in that incredibly dark place. A groundswell of individuals who say, I'm going to beat this fight. I'm going to win this game. Maybe not every battle, but I'm going to win the war. They try to help other people change their lives. We're trying to reach out to as many communities as humanly possible to help any individual battling that epic brain pain choose a life worth living, even when they're in the darkest of hours. I don't believe we can go see a person and save their life unless you're physically like moving them out the way of a train. But what we can do is instill a glimmer of hope in their brains and they can see that maybe there's another way, maybe there's another option, and they choose to do the work because it takes work. It's, it's an art to be well, uh, to save their own lives. And if they can find a way to have that hope to do that, once you're hopeless, that's all lost. You can get to a side once hopeless occurs. But if you re reverse hopelessness, you help change a person's life so they save their own lives, change everything about their lives so they decide to live. You are your brothers and sisters keepers. And if you see someone in terrible emotional, maybe mental pain, please say something. And if one of you is suffering and you're quiet about it, today, Tomorrow, the next, ask for help. Tell the truth about your pain because it is the only way to purge it from your soul. Your life matters to everyone you love, everyone who loves you, everyone who cares about you, and people you haven't even met yet. Look, Kevin, you know, as I said, one of the greatest things we can do is have that kind of impact on people's lives. It sounds like from what the science shows and what this may accomplish, a lot of lives may be saved. I hope so. I have now lived 15 years past the day I should have died. And I'm truly grateful for that second chance of life. That's powerful. That's powerful stuff. Wow. Wow. Ah. Uh. I'm still, I, I still get in awe just, you know, I know. It, it just, I know. It, just pulls me in. It, yeah, it, it's it's powerful. I apologize. The first part of that I had on mute by mistake because I, I was afraid that I was going to have background noise. But uh, please go and check out that documentary. It's powerful. That was the trailer I just pulled from um, YouTube, but you can certainly watch the whole movie. It's worth it, um, even if you just sort of... Um, you know, you just sort of want to get some insight into maybe a loved one who's struggling, right? Yes, you, you all, that that movie has changed so many people's lives. It has it has helped them to discuss the to discuss about the issue yeah. of of taking your life. And yeah. you know the men, let me say this, 
Yeah. And 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 we would think that with the holidays coming up and and with fall being here and the change in time and things of that nature, that would cause people to want to take their lives. Well, guess what? That's not the time. It's actually in the springtime mm. when things are new. People have had the holidays to come about and right. people then take start think about taking us because they don't get the visits then and and all those good things that have occurred during that past time in you know November, December, Christmas and all these good things. And so when mm. it comes springtime, that's when people start thinking about it because people share their happiness, but the ones that's not happy, it, it causes them to think about what they've lost and what they don't have. And we find out that over in the West, in the upper West, because people are not connected as well, and you got all those acres and acres of land because they don't communicate and connect with one yeah. another, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the suicide goes up. Isolation. In that area. Yeah. What do you um what do you recommend for people? I mean, I know this is what you do now, but like, you know, I think we are so consumed with this pandemic worrying about ourselves that we forget to check in on loved ones. Like, what do you recommend that people be doing um to sort of help? I mean, I just look at the sister in the movie and she was just like, you know, she had no idea that Kevin was struggling and she was in tears like if I only knew, like what can we all be doing differently and better to look after our loved ones? Well, hey, check in with them. <laughs> That's one thing you can do. Just call them up and say, hey, checking in on you. My sister and I do that. Now, I might not speak to my sister for maybe six or seven days, but believe me, she is going to either call me or I'm going to call her. And when that happens, kaboom, we, we catch up on things and, and we check on this. But call one another. If you don't have people to call, hey, use warm lines, peer warm lines. Yeah. Okay. They're available to you free of charge, 24 mm -hmm. seven, you know, and you can use them to try to, you know, cope and deal with isolation, depression. Um, you have those, hey, start using online um, 12 steps. If you are into that, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's multiple ways of connecting with others and just know that they're there to help and they want to help. Wendell, how has talking about your story helped you heal? It's a continuous thing, believe it or not. Um, in this, I've become more vulnerable and more honest with myself mm -hmm. to the point of that it's caused me remember i was talking about i had went to therapy and i hated it because mm -hmm. it what you don't know is is like i looked at therapy and the person was saying well what do you want to talk about and they would say whatever you like to talk about mm -hmm. no 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 what, what what can we talk about and at that time in my life i didn't have the no with it all to know what to talk about right. nobody Nobody don't tell you what to do in therapy, what it's like for the first time or or anything like that. We just went in and start having a session and and it's and you all that's not the way to do do it. You, so for some, I say that. But some you, you have to really be guided in, okay, how do you want to live your life better? Right. What does that mean to you? You know, you have to really look at those questions and 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 say, or even just be vulnerable and honest and say, I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know what to do right now. Can you please help me? And with doing that, that can open up an avenue for you to express yourself, to get like my sexual, my sexual abuse issues. Mm -hmm. I, I'm able to talk about that now. And right. in my view, it's not scared. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's more clarity and it's more like, you know, that's, that's not a good way of thinking about this stuff or mm -hmm. how you relate to people and stuff like that. And, and it, those type of things help 
But once again, for me, I, I had to use the medication because it sort of like slowed my thinking down mm -hmm. enough to where I can say, oh, this thought is how it's connected to this. And and that helped me to talk. Reason why I'm saying about the therapy is because with being clear now, it's opened up the avenue to say, maybe I should give it another try. Yeah. No, and 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 yeah, and that's I think that's a very important message to convey to people that like, you know, you don't always find the right fit at first, but you can't give up. Right. Just because you meet someone. I have a, a friend of mine who who is anti therapy because he had one negative experience or and, and, and he loses in the end. Right. Just because you try someone doesn't mean that there's nobody else who's a better fit. I mean, you just have to keep trying and, and find the right therapist for you. And don't be don't be, you know, discouraged that there isn't someone who can support you. You just have to find the right therapist. Um, so don't give up, I guess, is the message here. Don't give up because the net for you is you found someone who supports you that you're comfortable with. That wasn't the first experience. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I tell you, I, I, this I'm. I know that time would give you an incident. So you got two elephants, two elephants are going at it. I mean, going hard. And I learned this from my psychiatrist at this time. He had a picture on the wall of two elephants going at it. And it ended up that um, I said, hey, man, why you got that picture of these two elephants going at it? And he asked me, what did I see? And I said, I see two elephants going at it. <laughs> He's like, what else do you see? And I'm like, N nothing else. <laughs> and it ended up, he said, the elephants are hurting the grass. The grass is hurting the ants. The ants are being hurt and it caused those things that eat the ants to hurt. And then it, those things that eat the ants and those that eat the ants, those things hurt. And he just connected all of that. And it made me think like this. You got two elephants going at it and no one is giving that leeway right? and it's going back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And you got one that's a fear of everything. And then the other one is saying, go for it, go for it. But my fear keeps interfering with my go for it, go for it. Yeah. And it's hurting everybody. Yes. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. I'm hurting everybody around me with my fear yeah. of not getting help. Right. Powerful, powerful message there. I think, I hope everybody hears that message. So Wendell, what's, what's next for you? You're in a movie, you're, <laughs> you're doing great things every day. Tell us what's next for you and people, they can reach out to you. There's your website is in the ticker at the bottom of the screen. Um, what you up to? Well, see, what had happened was when I was telling you about all that writing and everything, well, guess what? Got a book. Got <laughs> what a you got book. there? Got a book. And it's wow. called, the book is called There is No Health Without Mental Health Anthology Men and Mental Health. Let's talk about it. That's awesome. So we talk about, I mean, there's 14 guys, two women. When we come together, to share our stories of hope, of strength, and hopefully giving people that hope and strength and guidance. Man, we got so many stories in here. It 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 it, it cracks me up. We got a pimp, a male escort who used, I mean, he tells wow. his survival story. Wow. We talk about not only that, but it's another gentleman. He talks about how his family was quite poor and they lived in a an abandoned um uh, what you call the big old traveling bus looking things, RV? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how that it was abandoned and how they got through it, through a, a hole in the um, bottom of it and how that they were so poor that he couldn't, af his father couldn't afford clothing or anything. So they had to hand wash and do bucket baths. And then after that, wrap themselves on, on a mattress or in a mattress, I should say, and wow. survived that way. And wow. he shares this story and the survival 
the resiliency that each of these stories tell. Vanessa Abram, whoo, this is this is the idea of where the book comes from. She tells the story about her brother who was in the military who, who decides to take his life. And you know, in the military, there's 22 people taking their lives each and every day. Yeah. Do suicide. Yeah. Because of the pain, because of the pressure, because of I have to be a man. I have to show that I'm a man. And we're learning more and more how men are taking their lives because it just can't take it anymore. Yeah. That book shares about those stories. Amazing. But, but it shares about their recovery too. Good. Yeah, I believe in this power of storytelling. I think it's wonderful that you've compiled that into a book. And I think we need to do more storytelling and tell people our journey because then they don't feel so alone, right? I thought I was the only one. And let me tell you, um, for the men that's out there, and I have to I have to say this real good and real clear, that there's a men-like group. It's spelled T-E-T-H-R. And let me tell you, it's a men's fellowship. Nice. 24-7. Nice. And you can talk about anything and everything. And they understand. And you got people to care about you. I didn't know about it. Uh, because it never had been spoken about men doing these things. Sure. But let me tell you. Mm. It's something that's out there to help us men because it's talking about longevity. I want to live a long time, but yeah. I got so much crap in my mind and how I behave and mm -hmm. you all, ooh, it messes up. Mm -hmm. Remember the elephants? Everything. Yeah. So I had to come to a realization that, man, what I've been doing ain't working. It's time for something new. And guess what? Change ain't change until you change. There you go. Oh my goodness. And on that note, I want to thank you for joining us today. I think I think your message is amazing. I love your work. I hope everybody goes and checks out the ripple effect and your book. Yeah. I'll put the link to your book into the into the notes so people can see where to get your book. And I can't thank you enough, Wendell, for spending your evening with me um, and Michelle's conversations that matter. We appreciate that. No. Thank you all. I, I bow down, Miss Michelle. I bow down <laughs> because you're making big things happen and you're giving people a voice. And that's what we need. Who's your voice? My grandmother gave me mine. Yeah. But men, we need your voice. I love and it. We need you to help others to develop their voice for the next generation. Amen. Thank you, Wendell. Thank you so much. And I look forward to following your work and stay Thank connected. You. I shall, I shall, I shall. You have a good night. <laughs> you too. <laughs> All right.